Hello everyone, and welcome to another Genshin lore video. Today, I'll be going over the history of the two Hydro Archons, Agiria and Fosalor. I'll be going over the lore presented in various Fontaine weapons, artifact sets, and so much more. Also, this video does contain spoilers for the quests listed on screen now, so if you haven't done those, you have been warned. Anyways, let's move right on and get into the video. The story of the Hydro Archons begins long ago, back when the Primordial One first entered Tevat. After they arrived, they went to war with and defeated the seven dragon sovereigns that ruled the lands. As a result of this, the Dragon of Water was removed from its position as the heart of the Primordial Sea. Seeing this empty space, the Shade of Life, one of the Primordial One's four shining shades, would create Agiria to act as the Primordial Sea's new heart. Despite the alien origins of the Primordial One, Agiria was formed from material originating from Tevat. At the time of her birth, however, no divine duty was assigned to her. According to legend, Agiria would later shed the first tear, which would give rise to the first of the Oceanids. Over time, more Oceanids would be born, and they would all follow Agiria. She decided to send the Oceanids across the waters of Tevat as spies, with the goal of connecting everyone in the world. Of course, the Oceanids would occasionally encounter human life, and they eventually became envious of them and desired to live on the surface. Hearing their wishes, Agiria decided to put water from the Primordial Sea into their veins, which allowed the Oceanids to become humans. However, Celestia soon noticed this act of life performed by Agiria and deemed it a sin. Agiria would be sealed in a primeval prison for her crimes, forcing her to leave her people behind. A prophecy would also be set in stone here, which claimed that the waters would one day rise and dissolve the people of Fontaine back into their original forms. With Agiria imprisoned by Celestia, there was no one in charge of ruling the territories now known as Fontaine. In this time period, humanity began coveting things that belonged to Celestia and attempted to break away from their fates. As a result, civilizations would rise and fall across Fontaine for a long time thanks to rain and floods sent by Celestia. In fact, this cycle lasted so long that Gurabad and Sumeru rose and fell while it was still going on. Eventually though, the god king Remus would arrive and bring the people together creating his civilization of Remuria. He would teach people how to build houses, farm, and appreciate the arts and music. He firmly believed that as long as the harmonious symphony of prosperity continued to play, Remuria and its people would prosper forever. Unfortunately for him though, Remuria was prophesied to face the most utter destruction, with its people destined to return to the Primordial Sea. Naturally, Remus didn't want this to happen, and so he worked to make sure the prophecy would not come to pass. He would try to eliminate any sources of the prophesied destruction, and he would even go after those who did not accept his rules. Instead of helping though, this only quickened his downfall. A rebellion of barbarians and bishops led by the dragon Scylla would fight against Remus and his army. In the last moments of his civilization, Remus realized his wrongs and tried to save his work, but it was too late, and Remuria fell into the abyss. Of course, there is more lore than this, so if you want to know more, check out my video on Remuria. Anyways, after the fall of Remuria, Fontaine would once again enter an era of chaos. Soon though, Celestia would call upon Agiria to rule Fontaine once again, freeing her from the prison they put her in. Agiria would unite the people of Fontaine, guiding them with laws which still endure to the present day. For her efforts, she was awarded the Hydronosis, and she would ascend as the first Hydro Archon of Fontaine. However, she secretly wished to deceive Celestia and find a way to stop their prophecy. Shortly after becoming the Archon, she would instruct a group of criminals to guard her secret beneath the waves. This secret ended up being an entrance to the Primordial Sea, over which a sluice gate would be constructed to seal it off from Tevat. Over time, this location would grow into what we now know as the Fortress of Meripede. Additionally, 
Agiria would assign Fosalor, one of her Oceanid followers, to be her successor in the event of her death. Of course, Agiria's death would eventually come. 500 years before the event of the main story, the Cataclysm would begin. Abyssal forces would begin emerging from Tunigi Hollow in Sumeru's Girdle of the Sands. Agiria, along with several other gods, would immediately head to the area and fight. Unfortunately, Agiria would be slain during this conflict, turning into a pool of sweet dew known as the Amrita. Greater Lord Rukadavada, the Dendro Archon at that time, would then grow a magnificent tree known as the Harvest Stockum from the Amrita. Agiri's consciousness would then remain anchored to the mortal realm, dwelling within the lotus at the center of the Harvest Stockum known as the Gaokarina. However, the influx of abyssal energy during the Cataclysm would begin corrupting the Harvest Stockum, threatening to take it out. Luckily, Samurg, a bird made of a shard of Kavarina created by Nabu Malikata, would sacrifice herself to purify and save the Harvest Stockum. Her form would shatter into countless pieces of Kavarina, which would eventually become the Pari we see around the Harvest Stockum today. These Pari worship the Harvest Stockum as their god. Interestingly though, this tree actually has pieces of three different gods, those being Agiria, Rukadavada, and Nabu Malikata. Just like Remuria, I do have a video that goes more in depth with this topic, so if you want to know more, be sure to check it out. With Agiria slain though, Foslor would ascend as the new Hydro Archon. As a result of the title changing hands, many of the Oceanids would cut ties with Fontaine. A good amount of them ventured to the Harvest Stockum in search of Agiria, but when they saw what remained of her, they decided to spread out across Tavat instead. As the Hydro Archon, Fosalor would continue Agiria's wish of deceiving Celestia by coming up with a very clever plan. She would separate her divinity from her body and spirit, leaving behind a human who she named Farina. She would keep her Gnosis and Divine Half inside the Oratrice, while Farina would act as the Hydro Archon to deceive the masses. In order for Farina to do this for a long time, Fosalor would place a curse on her that made her immortal so long as her divinity existed. Unfortunately, Farina wouldn't be able to pursue her own dreams during this time, as she always had to work on her act as the Hydro Archon to make Fosalor's plan work. Eventually though, after 500 years, Farina would go on trial, where it would be revealed that she is just a human. The Oratrice would then announce a verdict of the death sentence, but it wasn't for Farina. Instead, this death sentence was meant for Fosalor, who had planned this all along. For 500 years, the Oratrice would make Indemnidium to power Fontaine. However, most of this Indemnidium would actually be used by the Oratrice itself to save up enough power to execute Fosalor. After the trial, the death sentence would be carried out. A massive sword would descend onto Fosalor like a guillotine, ending her life. With this, the divine throne of the Hydro Archon would also be destroyed, meaning that she was the last ever Hydro Archon. Her death would also allow her full elemental authority to return to Nouvellet, the current Dragon Sovereign of Water. He would then use this authority to turn the primordial seawater in the veins of Fontanians into blood, making them true humans. As a result, when the floodwaters came, no one was dissolved, and Fontaine was saved from the prophecy. As for Farina, the death of Foslor would mean that her curse of immortality had been lifted. She no longer had to act as the Hydro Archon, and could finally live happily as a human. Anyways, that's pretty much it for the history of the Hydro Archons Agiria and Fosalor. The story of these Archons has quickly become a favorite of mine, so I really hope we get more information about them in future updates. Since Agiria was alive before Remuria was founded, we could potentially get more lore about her if we get to visit that fallen nation. If you want to hear more of my thoughts and more lore on the Archons though, I recommend checking out my videos on Rex Lapis, Lord Barbados, Rainé and Makoto, and Kusanali and Rukadavada. Of course, we have to wait until after 5.2 to know the lore of the Pyro Archons, so it'll be a little while before the series continues. Either way, I would love to hear what other bits of lore you'd like me to cover in the comments below as well. Anyways, that's it for this video, thank you so much for watching. 
Sources and further readings are also in the description if you want to check them out. I hope you all have an amazing day, and I'll see you all in the next video.